Well, that's bad news. Well, here's something that's a little bit curious. If you guys can see in there, those that gill plate is covered with, if they're little parasites or they're little worms. Welcome to the pond, the off-grid pond. As you guys know, we dumped in a whole bunch of trout in there. We got 60 trout, although we have a frequent visitor to the pond, the great blue heron. And he's been making a dent on things. Kevin's out here all the time. He's working on another project, but uh, he told me that he came out the other day and a heron flew in and then saw them at the last minute, flew into a tree and then took off. I said, good, because if it's coming back as much as I think it's coming back, it's definitely eating a ton of trout. And actually, no word of a lie, I was just setting up under the awning of the sauna and the heron came in from this direction here and just as I was coming out, turned around and bolted. So he's not an early morning fisher like I thought he would be. And you guys did offer some solutions to the problem. So I might take you guys up on that. I've looked into a heron decoy and I haven't read through all of the comments yet because I'm filming this as that video is coming out. But uh, we have another problem at the pond here. And that is, uh, it's a major problem. Well, maybe, maybe a major, at least it's on the cusp of being a major issue. We have, we have some summer kill. I know summer kill could be just about anything and I actually don't want to pick this fish up here, but uh, it's been sitting here for a while. And I know that when fish sit there for a while, they, uh, they start to really, they really start to stink. He's, he's been there for a while. Kevin noticed it yesterday and I said, you know what? I want to show people what's going on in the pond. So uh, keep it protected. So he put a lid on it, put a bucket on it. That, that's down here and left it for me. Cause I wanted to look at, see what the age of the fish was. That's a good, um, half pounder three quarter pound trout oh and it, yeah it does stink but uh we've got a lot of water turbidity the water quality is not good it has rained an unseasonable amount this summer not this fall i see another fish that's dead oh this is not good i just noticed another fish dead up on the bank there kevin just showed up with a load of wood kevin from modern self-reliance did you see that fish over there uh oh yeah where did you, did you fish that one out? I fished the other one out there that you covered up and then I stood up and looked and there's another one there. Yeah. That that one, that's a weird one. Well, that one maybe floated after a while. Oh, so And then something maybe tried to play with it and grab it up the bank, but a raccoon didn't get it, but that's two fish dead. Are they big ones or are they? Well, that's a big one, yeah. <laughs> it's like we got three inches of, water, of rain the last couple of days. So I imagine if that played a little part of it or. Well, that's, right. what I, that's what I was saying. So there's the, the there's water, the water turbidity is high. So it's muddy, trout-like, cool, clear water. And this is far from being clear at this point. And we've done a lot of uh, amending around here to prevent the erosion. So we've got it all planted, but still it's finding a way. It's a clay bottom. So anytime you get a, even a little bit of rain from the edges, it uh, increases the turbidity a lot. The, the heron came in this really? morning. I was just under the awning there. And it, did, did it come from that direction last time? It came from this direction over here. And then, then it saw us and it kind of like it, it aborted and then slammed into a tree and then took off. <laughs> I said, good. <laughs> I already told him that story, but that's, yeah. So he was coming in this way and then he noticed me last minute and he kind of tipped his wing on the uh, the tree and then he took did off. Did he so. hit a tree? Yeah, kind they're of. They're kind of like dopey, eh? Like, yeah. yeah. Not, they're not good flyers. I think, well, they're full of fish. Well, I was reading, I was reading that uh, you put a paracord or something like that to stop them flying through their flight path or something like you want to yeah. abrupt their flight path or decoys which i have a pelican will a pelican work a pelican might help but to, oh there's a fish rise there so there's there's some fish left our mending's going pretty good this is through uh bass pro shops cabela's bass pro shops here and then uh it's coming all the way back the clover's a little bit slow coming up but whatever all of their else is mixed in there that rape seed and all that other stuff the rye grass it's all coming in pretty good but you see the bigger leafy things, the, I think that's the clover is coming a little slow. The tad, look at the tadpoles eating that fish. That's crazy. I never thought they would, but I guess they're omnivorous. They'll eat anything. But that's, uh, that's the second fish. I'm trying to pick it up, but it really stinks. Oh, why does it stink so bad? You do want to avoid touching these at all costs because once that gets on your skin, it's like semi-permanent. Well, we don't want to leave these guys in the water. If there's two, if there's one, I would let the, the uh, tadpoles eat it and whatever else is in there. But if there's two, it's not good. It's just going to make the water that much worse. What do you think? Do you think this will work? 
you never know. I w I, this was given to me like many years ago, and I was like, what the heck am I ever going to do with a pelican? I don't know if it would notice it because it looks too wood-like almost. But well, it's... That's, you, you could put it on the bank, see what happens. Probably that bright spot, like overlooking the bank. So the actual, like if somebody comes in, maybe they could see that and be like, oh, look, at, there's a there's a predator or a pelican. I don't know, is it a predator or a pelican? Pelican <laughs> a predator? Sure. Rawr! I don't think they do that. Ha <laughs> ha! I don't know what, what does a pelican say. Pelican! Pelican! Well, that uh, pelican will have to do uh, overtime duty. Not what it's designed to do, but it's uh, going to have to do for now until I like, put uh, a heron decoy on order. They actually people use them for duck decoys because it, it's a confidence thing. And so the, uh, the the ducks will dive in on your set, right? Because they think, well, if a, if a heron is hanging out there, probably it's safe because herons are super territorial and they don't like anything to kind of interfere in their territory. If there's already, a, you know, something fishing there, I mean, they're not gonna, they're not gonna fish there at the same spot, right? It's just like hunters. They don't wanna be in the same spot hunting. But uh, it's always good to check my, oh, yep, there's a, there's a heron right in there. Been moving the camera from here, which is overlooking the bank, because I wanted to see if a deer would come in to eat the food plot stuff. Um, and then, uh, then I noticed the heron working over here, and then I wanted to see the heron fish, so I've moved the, the camera. Now it only overlooks the water. That heron is definitely eating fish every day. So every day we leave fish in the pond and don't deal with this heron, we're losing at least one fish a day. And it could be inviting other friends here too. In which case you could be losing more than one fish in a day. And if you do the math, well, after six days, we won't have any more fish. Regardless, I don't want to go through the whole season without having any fish. So I'm going to do something about that. The guy, is he moving? He's just sitting there. He's literally just sitting there. I was going to say he's not moving. Is not, it running? No, yeah, it's running. He's like, he's, he's like a, like a mannequin. Well, when I first set up this trail camera on the edge of the pond, I really thought I was going to get a different kind of pond predator, such as a mink to, uh, run in the pond and grab a fish and come out. But I didn't expect to have this heron set up shop. Look how still the heron is barely moving. You would think that was a decoy. Look at this guy just sitting there. And this, this is actual footage of a heron doing its work. These guys would be the most patient hunters in the world saying absolutely still until a fish rises. Here's another view of that fish rising. Look how the heron anticipates the fish coming up to the surface. It actually turns its head before even I can see that that fish rose. Watch again here. See how quick that head moved before even the fish came up to the surface. I wanted to slow this down for you guys. So really have a careful look of what the heron does, anticipating the fish coming up before it even comes up. And then there's that fish rising, probably to grab some kind of insect on the surface. And then here's another view. I wanna show you guys what's happening here. Watch how the fish comes up. And if you ever watch the fish in action, it actually sucks the surface of the water down to be able to eat that insect. And because there's stuff on top of the water, you can actually see the riffle. The stuff implodes in and the fish is able to suck in that little bit of food. Watch again here. You see that water move before the fish comes up and slurps it down. So actually fish makes a negative of vacuum by opening its mouth real quick. It sucks water into its mouth, which is pretty freaking interesting. So here's another clip that I thought was pretty interesting. This is a heron kind of working the bank. I thought that was interesting because probably the heron wasn't getting much success these last few days, primarily because the fact that the water is so so silty. See, the heron doesn't like to get its feathers wet, right? So it'll only fish up to its belly button. And then you can see the heron work the shoreline and you can see its silhouette. I just thought it was an interesting clip to see it work its way around. And obviously this is sped up so you could see it quicker. And the, the camera just picked up the strike here, but that uh, heron wasn't taking a bath. It was actually going for a fish there, but it missed. There's interesting how after a try, the heron will uh, dry its feathers off because obviously it needs to be able to fly away. And here's another miss. <laughs> goes after it, goes for the dunk, but comes up empty handed. And uh, in disgrace, it has to dust itself off and fix its plumage. So if it needs to fly away, it can. Now here it is again in slow motion. Did you see what it's after? So I think whatever it was going for was out of the frame. You can see that that heron is fully committed, dives right in. Now here's an interesting clip. You see the heron fly from left over to the right. 
So it obviously had landed there and then noticed something. So it flew over probably to investigate. Now here's the interesting thing. Now it flies back over and keep watching because what you're gonna see is part of our mystery be answered. So let's keep, uh, keep an eye on things. Now I watched over 40 minutes of this heron hovering over the pond just to pick out the interesting clips. But if you notice now, it starts to move over to the left because it notices something moving. So there's something it's focused on here and then it's just about to enter the frame. So you can't see it right now, but down below the frame here at the, the base here, there's actually a fish moving. And so the heron is gonna go over to have another look. And then a short time later, the heron moves back and you can see just at the edge of the frame at the bottom there, there's a fish that's not doing so well. So that's probably the one of the ones that's got all the clay inside of its gills, making it not, uh, not swim very well. And so that answers the question of why do we had a dead fish? So we actually saw that fish die. Now, over the course of looking at all of the trail camera footage, I, uh, I felt like I got to know this heron and get to know the life of a heron. So this is 10 minutes straight of this heron fishing and uh, sped up real quick. <laughs> you can see long pauses, but uh, also after 11 minutes, it ends up with one fishing opportunity right here and it comes up empty-handed. Now this next segment shows the heron working for an extremely long time. So I've gained some respect for this heron rather than see it as an enemy. I see it as a kind of co-predator in over 20 minutes, this heron had one opportunity but still came up empty-handed. So as you guys know, I set some rat traps earlier at the cabin and I had uh, Kevin from Modern Self Reliance check to see if we don't catch a red squirrel. We had it put up in the cabin loft rafter space there because it was, uh, it was potentially going to eat some of the wires that we had set up there for the solar system. But anyway, those uh, rat traps from Princess Auto are still empty and uh, Kevin's gonna keep an eye on things for me. That is super frustrating. When we set up like, I don't know, we didn't plan to set up. We wanted all the edges to be deep, but we set up this perfect little cliff over here. Well, not a cliff, just a ledge. So he stands on the ledge here and uh, and then he picks off anything that swims by. Uh, well, that's it. That solves the mystery. Well, it's not a really mystery. It's just a guess. Yeah, there are ways to trap these guys. Um, like I could put a foothold trap on the water there and probably cut them. And then once he gets leg gets caught, he'll just fall in the water and that'll be the end of him. Although uh, that is frowned upon in the trapping community and also completely illegal. And uh, our MNR would not appreciate that at all. And then uh, whatever we're losing on the bottom here from just like natural uh, turbidity plus oxygen deprivation and heat, it's all that stuff. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna get to the bottom of this by the end of this video. What's that? The relic, look at that. What's that thing? It looks like a, like a bottom of a pan or something. I think it's metal. That's weird. Look, there's all sorts of junk over there. Anyways, that's a side note. <laughs> Pelican's gonna go right here. It looks like the heel of a shoe. Pottery with the little blue writing on it. It's an old, an old plate. Somebody didn't like anymore, so threw down here in your... Uh, how? Just down here in the dirt. <laughs> like how, how in the middle of the forest is there plates at, 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 at the bottom of a shoe? Look. Those little holes where the stitching would be on the, on the, like that's probably the front of the shoe. Well, if you go up in the bush there, you'll see all kinds of old metal from farm equipment that farmers and whatever discarded because it didn't work anymore. That's so, crazy. I, like, there's stuff everywhere. I think like metal detector or something. Well, there's something like, I don't know what the heck this thing is. I didn't even, look, look at this thing. What is this? Probably an old piece of the tractor. Oh, it looks like a plate or a bowl or a, like something. A metal bowl? Could oh. be a pot, cast iron. It looks, feels like it's cast iron. I'm going to clean that thing up. It looks kind of neat. That's weird. Looks like trash to me. Hey, it's cool, man. First bit of detective work that you should do when you're trying to figure out what's good for your trout is check the, the temperature. So Kevin looked up because I forgot the temperature. Uh, what's the optimum temperature? Did you remember? No, I didn't. wasn't listening. F what? You don't listen to me? 54 Fahrenheit. 54 Fahrenheit. It's optimal. It says rainbow trout can be found between 44 Fahrenheit and 75 Fahrenheit or 6 degrees and 23 Celsius. 54, we're looking good. 
Uh, so I've got my little fish pond thermometer here. It does a pretty decent job. We did lots of erosion control here before. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get down uh, too deep with this, but we will get like a kind of a surface-ish. We might get down three or four feet, uh, but the active, the active layers of the water where the trout like to spend, they obviously go down 10 feet. Um, let's see what air, air temperature right now is, let's say 70, 70 Fahrenheit. So we're gonna, we're just gonna leave this in the water, let it do its thing, take a little bit of time to adjust. And then if we, if we don't find the temperature we want, we do want to see that the trout can have uh, refuge down lower. So we might get, uh, we'll tie it on the end of the fishing line and throw it out down in the middle so we can get down like at the very, very bottom to see if there's a difference. I did plan to take a lot of the fish out of here before the winter because we want to be able to skate on it and then we can't keep the oxygen going in the pond while uh, the aerator is going that will weaken the ice and then we'll probably fall through. But uh, I was hoping to take fish out a lot later than now we're in June. Uh, I was hoping probably like July, end of July, where it's like the warmest, and then let them grow into uh, August, September, October, November, even December, because that's going to be the peak growing season where they're in their optimum temperature and feeding a lot and get bigger and fatter. And then we can pull them all out at the same time. Uh, but like I said, I did plan to take it out like, you know, five or 10 or 15 or something before we got to July, or if not around July. But seeing as how we got two dead fish already, this is uh, really important. All right, so Kevin's got his own set of problems here. I'm trying to, he's trying to figure out how to heat this giant pool. Yes. He's calling it a pool. It's, it's, actually, a, it's actually like an animal water feeder. Well, it's... Converted... Do they sell them as the pools? Or is this like a, uh, yes. one of your brain, well, it, brain children? Sort of. I, I don't know. Like, I think, like, people with small backyards, this is an ideal waiting pool for small children, and you don't want the expense of a really big in-ground pool. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to do something much more fun today. I'm going to uh, fly fish. I'm going to use my post-fly tackle, my mystery tackle box, and uh, see how many fish we can get out of here. Kevin wants a couple for himself. He's going to give some away to friends. I'll take the rest home. Also got the MTB, mystery tackle box swag. It's, this is actually a cool fit. Uh, a lot of t-shirts, well, they're, first of all, they're not made out of good material. This one is nice and comfy and actually it fits. It fits nicely around the arms and it's nice and loose around the belly. You guys, I talked to you guys about last time. Um, I, get, I, got, I don't have a belly. It's bloated from uh, GERD. I didn't mention in the last video that I wasn't feeling well and that's why I wasn't filming so much. And uh, it's GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, although not diagnosed with it. I am on meds right now and the meds are helping, but they're not perfect. So anyway, we got dis distended, <laughs> distended belly. It's fat, not fat. That's that's the fat part. That's a little bit. So it's only contributing that much to the overall bump. Obviously, I'm pushing it out here. I can, I can still suck it up a little bit. But anyway, the t-shirts fit nicely. Fly set, fly rod set up. It's always fun to catch trout top water. It's fun to catch any fish top water. To watch them explode up and grab it. I don't know how well it's going to work today though with that water clarity. You know, it obviously works a lot better if you have some clear water. So you get one on the dry fly, I would say that would be a victory for today. Which one would you guys pick out of here? Big fat, that's a big fat caddis fly right there. We're not gonna go that big, although we could. Well, as much as I would like to use my spin rod, I will get it ready because I don't think I'm gonna catch as many fish as I would like to on the fly rod. Cause like I said, I'm not that good at fly fishing and also the water is like not really the perfect condition for fly fishing uh, i got a super old fly rod i've had this since i was a kid and uh, never felt the need to upgrade it at all but i have been getting back into fly fishing and uh, that's why it's nice to have post fly so what's cool about post fly is that they give you a new box every single month so here's a, an example of one box this is actually the salt water box so they give you a bunch of salt water flies you can see these are big fat streamers i won't be able to cast the streamers with my rod because it's uh, set up for uh, wet flies and dry flies but uh, post fly has everything comes every month you guys check the links in the description down below there's a code for it so you're going to get a pretty sweet discount and then you if you guys aren't into fly fishing maybe you guys want to check out mystery tackle box the same exact concept this came out before post fly and uh, same idea except obviously this is for spin tackle so we might get into that uh, but today i really want to uh, work on my fly fishing because well i've got a lots of welcome uh prey for me to try it on so we got a whole bunch of these are uh these all looks like dry flies 
Um, and then here's some, uh, these local wet flies and nymphs. Well, I think I'm gonna try something a little bit bigger, something that'll cast a little bit of a silhouette on the water. Hopefully the fish will be able to see that a little easier. You see, it's got uh, a lot of big wings. The secret weapon, of course, for today is gonna be these polarized glasses, because that'll let me see, hopefully the trout a little bit better coming up to rise. I'm not seeing a lot of top water action right now, but that could change. It could change at any moment. I'm not terrible at fly fishing. Maybe I just, uh, I don't love it as much. I find it, I find it challenging and frustrating at the same time. So maybe that's a good thing that I keep practicing. Maybe you guys want to start something new. Fly fishing is a really good thing to practice, test your patience, test your skill. And uh, you know, there's a fish. Did you guys hear that jump? <laughs> Let's go. Well, I knew I forgot something. I forgot my net, <laughs> which is gonna make everything that much harder to catch. <laughs> we got the cooler all ready to go, so we can jump the fish in there. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun landing all these fish. Once I get my cast angles down, we'll be good. So we gotta get that fish up in the water column to look at that fly. Well, the hope of catching one on the dry fly is diminishing <laughs> significantly. Well, I think because this thing's <laughs> the same color as the pollen, I, I just think they're just like, maybe they've already eaten pollen and they're like, I'm not touching anything that's white. So I'm gonna try something different. So I'm gonna go opposite now. I'm gonna try something black. Black and wet, wet fly. If not, I can go to like these bigger streamers here. <clears throat> All right, let's see how this black wet fly works. And I noticed that when I stopped casting, two fish actually <laughs> came up <laughs> and grabbed stuff. And this, this pollen is like getting all over the uh, line that's sitting in the water here. So, well, it's gonna be my goal today just to catch one fish on the fly rod. <laughs> Oh, there's one. There's a fish. Finally. Good sized one too. Not a big one, but we are gonna take we're gonna take ten out. That's gonna be the goal for today. Nice little rainbow. Ugh, okay. We're gonna knock him out. We're gonna knock them out and uh, we're gonna bleed them. Got them bled out, knocked out, and uh, got a rope. Throw them out in the water here. Nice little guy, throw them in the water, keep fishing. Oh man, these leaders get all up in the eyelets. So I got that on the wiggle. So I think that's what I'm gonna stick with for now until it stops working. So all I'm doing is wiggling the top here just to give it a little bit of bug action. Let's try to catch, catch one more on the fly. I think that would be fair. Then we could switch over. Catch maybe some of the bigger guys. Oh, there was a fish. That's a big one. Just as I spoke, this guy doesn't really know he's hooked yet, by the way. <laughs> this guy's like a log. He absolutely 100% does not know he's hooked. <laughs> oh, oh, he got off. Shoot. He didn't break off, he just got off. That was a big fish. Oh, there we go, there's another one. Oh, that's a tail dancer. Hoo hoo. <laughs> I think I've got the technique down now. I don't know if I should keep the rob tip up or low on this guy, but as long as he stays down, 
They're such good fighters. These guys. All right. I'll beach this guy here. There we go. Now if I don't lose him, that's fish number two. Nice top lip hook on him. Okay. There we go. Oh man. I'll cut a line now. Okay. Good. Ooh. Gosh, these guys are strong. Well, they seem healthy when you catch them. There. That did it. And then we, we cut the gills here just for a better, better flavor. Like so. And then we'll rinse this guy off. Rinse these two guys off. Well, I'm happy I didn't give up on the fly gear. Because this is giving me an excuse to practice. To get better at it. Not liking all this junk that's getting in the eyelets, but here we are. As you guys know, or may not know, fly fishing is an exercise in, <laughs> in frustration. Because if you're not not catching fish, that's only one thing. The rest of it, you're getting hooked up in the bushes, up in the trees, in lines all over the place, just like I am right now, up in the bushes and the shrubs. And then every time you cast, you gotta pull it back out if you mess up. Like I say, it's all about testing your level of ability to withstand frustration. <laughs> And uh, it's kind of a, a thing about life too. And I'm learning as I go that I need to strip down my line in order to get that uh, pollen off of it. So every time I go, I take that, that pollen, see that pollen there, which wants to wrap around it. And I can push it down the line to the end here <laughs> where it's kind of accumulating in a big giant ball, but at least it's not impeding me from fishing. And the rest of it is all just trying to get my line out as far as I can for longer retrieve. I get lots of little short casts out here like this, kind of work the edges. But once you get the mechanics of fly fishing down, it can be pretty relaxing. Well, there's one. See, as soon as I stop fishing and the clouds, the clouds helps, right? Here's the clouds come in. It's right in my zone there. They are sipping on bugs, so they're looking for them. Can you guys tell how muddy it is? There's another one, how muddy the water is. Might be throwing catfish in here next year. <laughs> Not my favorite, but the trout don't work. Every year is an experiment, right guys? I'm gonna try a sneaky trick. So we're not gonna throw a ton of feed in there. Just kind of enough to get them a little bit excited. I got a fish off that? No way. Dude, I just let it sink to the bottom. Oh, I had a fish. I, I literally just let it sit on the bottom. Oh, that was a bite, I think. Well, I really don't want to throw any more feed out there because, well, it's almost a whole thing. Whole day's worth of food. Huh. Well, I'm going to cast this out while I come up with a different game plan. But we're either switching to worms or uh, switching to spin tackle. I'll let that sit down on the bottom. You never know. It might catch one. Those fish might wake up. Who knows? But these other fish definitely need to get put in the cooler. They're going to get way too warm out here. Two smaller fish. Well, decent size. Eater fish. Plater fish. These are like the ones you want to eat. One each. That's the idea. Well guys, I don't feel that terrible about my fly fishing skills anymore because there's a whole bunch of feed on there, on the top of the water. And I only saw two, well I heard two fish jump to grab feed. That's not good. Not a good sign. I would rather if I was like a bad fly fisherman rather than like, you know, not a bad fly fisherman, but there was tons of fish left because obviously I care more about having a healthy pond than my ego about my fly fishing. It could be just the water's heated up too and they don't want to they don't want to feed midday and so they they want to sit down nice and low in the water column. I do have to check that water temperature which will maybe we'll do that right now. This is a good gauge. If you ever guys ever want to go trout fishing and you're not sure if the trout fishing is good or not, just check the water temperature and that'll give you a really good idea. So it's uh 65 uh, now I forget what optimum was. I think it was 50. So that's that's only a couple of feet down. So by the end, we'll check again to see what it's like uh, 
a lot deeper than that. Switch over to the uh, mystery tackle box. Now we're off the post fly. We're into the mystery tackle box. We can move around now because we don't have to worry about our back cast anymore like we do with the fly rod. Fly rod's tough, man. You gotta find just the right places to do it. And uh, not everywhere works, especially those tight creek fishing spots, right? So you can get yourself mystery tackle box and a post fly and you'll be all set. This is a little bit higher impact and then a worm is like zero impact because you could just basically let it sit on the bottom forever and eventually a trout will come and find it. It's definitely a tough fish right now. But again, those fish are not, they're not in the right temperature zone. So of course they could all be dead on the bottom. Yeah, that's a possibility. We're hoping that's not the case. Oh, that was a branch. Thought it was a fish. Oh, that's a fish. Oh, jeepers. That's a bigger fish. My drag is set way too tight. <laughs> I think that was a fish on the first cast. <laughs> All right. Or the first strike, I mean. Let's get her down here to our beach and spot. Stay with me, buddy. Oh, I always forget how much power these guys have. I turn them around. All right, let's get them down here to beach them. I don't think that, that hook's not on there too good anymore. Oof. Oh yeah, it's good. All right, there we go. That's a bigger one. You know, if we caught like eight of these, I wouldn't say we needed to, uh, you know, take them all like that's a big one so we don't need to take a whole bunch of these guys out yeah she was barely hooked there all right now rather than pick him up I think we're gonna we're gonna conk him down here he's guys got some weird stuff growing on their gills weird bugs that doesn't look great. Well, here's something that's a little bit curious. If you guys can see in there, those that gill plate is covered with, I don't know what that is even. Still got some nerves going there, but if they're little parasites or they're little worms, like they don't seem to be moving, but they're covered all in the gills like both sides like this side here all in here was all covered you see that you guys know what that is so that's that's definitely something that's going to be harming those fish um maybe what killed those other ones off but it's all up inside there so that's not good so if you guys you guys know what that is let me know but uh i'll see if I, i'm gonna catch some more i'm gonna keep catching them if they're like that if they're all like that then they're all gonna come out because i don't think those fish are gonna survive like that that might be the water quality is not good it's muddy and uh that's kind of curious there's a the little bug <laughs> bug that they're eating but that's not that's not all right something's up with these fish well now we gotta keep fishing I checked the other fish. It didn't seem like they had anything on them. They, they're they smaller, so it's hard to tell. Obviously, the, the fish are active now. They figured out that the feed's up there, but we got to catch a couple more just to see if they don't all have that. Could be something to do with the water, the water quality, or they're just it's just infested with those kinds of beetles. But we'll find out. Get a couple more fish and see if they don't all have that, in which case, I don't know, that might be the end of this pond here. Now that the fish are woken up, it should be a little bit easier to a little bit easier to catch some. Oh, one just swiped there. I don't know if you guys saw that, but I did. <laughs> he swiped and he missed. Oh, he missed again. <laughs> Try a little lower in the water column, let it sink a little bit more. A slow retrieve. <laughs> Oh, we might have to switch to a worms. Oh, there we go. Just as soon as I say that. <laughs> I knew I didn't get a good hook set on that guy. Yep. I tried to set it again and I knew it was going to pull out. 
All right, guys. Well, I just had lunch and I watched the fish. Basically, they ate all of the feed, so they're active now. So I know there's some left, <laughs> but I'm going to go with the tried and true method because time's running on here and we really need to get at least seven more fish out. <laughs> well, I see you, I hear you, I'm coming after you. So they're still healthy enough to eat, but I do think there's something wrong with them. I'm gonna get a little better uh, picture off that one trout and then uh, maybe I'll give Clark a call and see if he knows what's going on. If anybody knows, he knows. Put it that way. So let's see. Let's see how good a worm works in comparison. It's, you know, yeah, we, yeah, we know you're there. We got you. In this muddy water, it's gonna leave scent too. And those trout are really gonna pick up on it. And then I can fish it a lot slower and a lot lower. But I'm glad to see that those fish are still alive. So I was getting pretty worried there. But we really gotta decide this year if uh, this is gonna be a trout pond or if we're gonna have to put something else different in there. There's a bite. There's a fish. Oh, there's a big fish. Whew. I'll back that drag off a little bit. I really want to see if this guy's got that issue with the gills or not. Oh, they got some fight. It's always risky up at the bank. There we got him. Did he swallow that? Oh yeah, he was hungry and he swallowed it. Let's see if I can get that out. There's a trick where you stick your finger, and you guys can see that. You stick your finger in, and then you put your finger right up into the hook, and then you push and pull at the same time, and sometimes you, you can get it out. Sometimes. I stick your finger in there, and I'm pushing against the hook, and I'm keeping it tight and then you gotta kinda work it backwards. Sometimes it'll catch again. So there we go. There's a good trick you guys can use if you want. Okay, so th these guys, I should check the gills first. This is a healthy fish. This guy doesn't have all that stuff on there at all. Okay, well that makes me really relieved. Oh, that's a relief. This guy's gills, oh, why are you still going? This guy's gills are a lot, uh, they're healthy. Healthy, healthy. No problems at all with the gills. I don't see any of those worms on there. Um, perfectly healthy fish. So we're still on track there. We're gonna catch a couple more, but uh, that makes me pretty relieved. Because if all the fish had that stuff on there, I'd be, I'd be super worried. Anyway, into the cooler she goes. But you definitely need a cooler with hot weather like this. Oh, there's a fish, second cast. There we go, he's gonna go up, he's gonna rise. Oh, these trout are such good fighters. You guys want trout for your pond, the Linden Trout Hatcheries is the place to go. Excellent fighting fish. So his gills are good too. So it was only that one fish that had it, but it's still, it's still worth investigating. There we go. Take them out of the cooler and we'll throw them in the water to get a drink. There's a, there's a good haul for you guys there. Check that out. How many we got? One, two, three, four, five. Five, pretty good. Oh, there's a bite again. See that line out, now it's taking it. So now it's got it. We don't want it to swallow it. So I think this guy's a little bit smaller or he's swimming toward me. Oh, he's a good sized one. If we land this guy, this will be trout number... Trout number six. Oh, there we go. Trout number six. Yeah, that hook trick worked really good this time. I'm gonna get the gills. Check the gills. Healthy gills, healthy gills. I don't know what happened to the other fish, the two that died, but I could suspect it has something to do with the water quality. His water quality is not good. No, I forget again, was that six or seven? I think it's seven. And we've got three left to go. The fish are back active again. 
should be pretty simple to get uh, three more. That's our goal. There we go. It's hard to tell if these fish are big or not. He's a small one. A smaller one. You just horse him up. Now these guys are they're looking healthier and healthier as I go here. So it's giving me more confidence in the pond. There, just like that. See that? That's how you do it. You stick your finger into the hook. The hook goes into your, your nail there. And then you can pull it out. Oh, there's a fish. There we go. Oh, this is a bigger one. Yep. This one feels like a bigger one. Lots of dead weight on there. This is a bigger one. If this is a big, big one, this is going to be the last one. Oh, it looks like a big, big one. <laughs> Because a big, big one is as big as two small ones. Put it that way. Oh, look at, look at that reel work. Look at that drag work. Yeah, this guy's a football. This guy is legit football. Oh, okay. As soon as they go up once, you can, you, well, not this guy. I was going to say you can usually drag them back, but not this guy. Oh, this is a big one. Oh, the biggest one for last. Come on. Okay. Oh boy. Big fish. Come on then. Whoa. This is where it gets risky. Okay. Look at that hog. <laughs> now that's a freaking fish. That is a big hog of a trout. That is legit two pounder. <laughs> I can only get him around the neck. <sighs> oh, oh my gosh, so much power. Check the gills again. This guy looks fine too. It's like some kind of weird growth, but it only seems to be on those, those couple of bigger fish. So maybe some kind of lice or something. How about that, boys? Not bad for a day's worth of fishing. We'll let these guys rinse off. And then for being a good sport, after all this, we'll, we'll feed the survivors. <laughs> there you go, whatever's left is yours. We're not gonna do a big pull, hopefully, until uh, July, August. And we're gonna keep monitoring this pond to see if the turbidity comes down, probably the rain stops. As you guys could see, there's still a good mess of trout out there. So we did a little bit of damage here, probably about as much damage as the heron did, but uh, at least I get the benefit from it. I am also technically a pond predator and I'm okay with it. <laughs> so I did a lot of work. We, well, we did a lot of work. Kevin and uh, the whole crew put a lot of work into this pond. So to have freaking heron come and eat everything, well guys, the problem with catching a whole bunch of fish is of course that you have to clean a whole bunch of fish. Thankfully we have a table here at the pond that we can uh, set up to make things a lot easier than crouching down over the pond trying to clean, what did I get? Eight, nine, seven, eight. Eight or nine fish. I think it was eight. We counted the last one as two. How's that for a big slab of trout? Look at that big guy, that's a two pounder. We got a bunch of one pounders. We got some maybe half pounders mixed in there, all mixed in there. But that is a pretty productive pond. They've all got good colors. Originally I was thinking they're they lighter and whiter, but uh, they've got good colors now, that's for sure. So, here we go, lots of work to do. You don't want to smell these anymore? No, I don't, it's, it's gross. They're actually like, yeah. Well, the gills on these ones look fine, but also, if there was parasites, then they would have swam off by now. But Oh. We're gonna cook these. Yeah, cook them. Cook, cook them. <laughs> cook them. They'll heat. The, they'll heat the water. Ready? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Can't smell them anymore. No. You gonna eat those when they're done? Uh, no, they've been dead long, long dead. <laughs> we cook the stink out of them. Oh. Get some smoky flavor in there. I wonder if they would still smell after I, they get cooked. Yeah, you can try that. Eat the eyeball right now, Chris. Do it. 
I, I caught 10 fish already. I don't need those ones. Oh, well, look at it cooking nicely, though. They probably will. It's like a thousand degrees oven there, in there. There's no way you can cook that. See, the thing about fish is, fish, is it the smell? Is you're smelling the toxin? You're, so you're smelling the bacteria that's that's growing on top of it, and so bacteria poop. So even if you cook them, it would probably smell fine. But if you ate it, you would eat all of the bacteria poop. So that's what will make you sick. And the reason I know that is because uh, in Maine, I ate clams the next day that weren't refrigerated. And clams, you pull everything out. Uh, but there's the whole digestive system. This is a tons of bacteria in there. And so it smelled fine and it was cooked fine and it was in water and stuff, but I ate them. Dude, I was sick for like four hours just from the toxins of it. So I, I cooked the bacteria out. So it wasn't bacteria, it was like the toxins. So don't eat stuff that's rotten, even though it smells fine. So you still have to pay attention to the history of whatever it is you're gonna eat. They smell fine now, <laughs> burning, but you wouldn't want to eat them. Now we're gonna get a fire going here because I want to make myself a fish sandwich. Can't really finish off a fishing video if you don't do a cook. So we're getting a fire going here. At the root cellar up here, pond's behind us, it's pretty cool. Got a good fire burning down the coals and then I want to do like, I want to put the trout on a stick, which I had a sandwich, salmon sandwich the other day and it really hit the spot. So I'm thinking, what better over the fire, like with a fresh fish. So we got to get uh, this water thermometer down lower than what we had it. Uh, 56 was the optimum temperature. Well, see, it's not bad in the shade. It's like 60, 63. Fish are still, the remaining fish, I should say, are having a good time. But if I hook this up to the fishing line, we can get down to the bottom and then let it sit there for, for a while. Try to get it, uh, well, I think where the bubbler is is where the middle is. We cast it out. <laughs> it's funny cast it out to the middle and then we'll reel it back until we get it to approximately the middle there I'm trying to find a weed tree that Kevin probably won't want I think this qualifies here I'm not sure what species this is but I think it's a weed the easiest way to actually cut a tree with a knife when you don't have a saw is to score around the outside of the tree and then once you get it all the way around you can take it and you should be able to bend it and if you did it right it should snap of course it didn't what i wanted to do is this chew one way and then chew the other way nervous of going all the way through it here and cutting myself so I work away from me and then taking the branches off the rest is pretty straightforward Remove the rest of the bark here, pointy, like so. We're gonna harden this up, and uh, we'll make it so that it'll be it'll go through the fish a lot easier. I find uh, if you don't harden it, or if you don't do anything to it, the tip here will tend to be kind of rubbery and soft. There we go. That's nice and nice and hard, nice and pointy. Beautiful. I'm gonna do like a kind of a brief, a brief scaling on him. Um, he's pretty small. He's kind of on the edge of what you really would be concerned about for scales. Like you can see that his scales are pretty small, but kind of as they get bigger, the scales get bigger. There we go. So we'll go through the mouth here and then we want to find the back. There's the back here. That's the meat. You guys see that? The meat up in here. And then we want to follow the meat. So anytime I feel it coming out, I want to kind of redirect. So now I'm going kind of more into the tissue. And then basically I'm running it through like the meatiest part right here. The meatiest part of the whole fish. So it's not coming out the other side. And it's not coming out this side. And we want to be pretty aggressive with it. So that it gets all the way to the tail because it's been fairly warm out the uh the vertebrae the fish isn't rotting it's just at the kind of the right temperature though that a lot of this bone is coming out so adobo you guys can grab that of course on the website all the time whenever you want okay so there's another important thing the wind is going that way although it might be shifty so we'll see 
but uh, we want to figure out where where we want to put this fish so I always like to put it on the wind side because then it's going to catch it's going to catch the smoke so we're just going to use that log there just like so so we want to turn it so that the media side of it is down because that's going to take the longest to cook so I think it'll be a good idea can you guys see me from here it'd be a good idea to move this trail camera I mean it kind of works at this location but if I move it to the other side I might <laughs> this is just a weird way to film <laughs> I forgot I was filming like this <laughs> that if I move it over to the other side and get more like a broader view I might actually get to see what that uh, heron is going to do I'm not convinced that that decoy is going to do much but uh, we'll find out we just got to figure out how to tie it to something to get it get it working how we want it to so maybe like uh let's use the maggot bucket we can attach the camera to it <clears throat> put a big old rock in here because this is kind of off label this is like really not how you want to set a trail camera up because if it's too light it's going to end up in the drink All those fish are still jumping, still happy, healthy. Well, the ones that made it through, there's one. The ones that made it through today, anyway. There's another one, just off, just off camera. There's, I think that one got on the frame. I'm curious to see what the temperature is. So I'm gonna reel it up from the bottom here and find out. Well, the bottom is much like the top. It is uh, 62, 62 degrees. That's cool though. That's actually, well, cool. Yeah, no pun intended. It's cool because the whole water column is the same temperature. So that means that, well, it's it's turning over and then the fish are using, they can use the whole water column. So even there's not a lot of water, the top of the water is the same temperature as the lower of the water. So it means it's, you know, it, that's good. That's actually a good thing. So that trail camera is just over there on the bucket. It used to be over here on that tree. So we should have a good vantage point for the heron doing any fishing there. And the pelican is right there. I don't know if that's going to throw the heron off or not, but we'll find out. So I've got that trout cooking over the flame here on a stick. And I brought some cool ingredients. I won't make something that I've never really made on this channel before. But uh, I'm excited for it. Because I've been eating some, some fish in the last few days and it's been from a can. So this will uh, this will this will definitely blow that out of the water. You'll know it's kind of done when uh, you touch the well when the oil drips out of it. That's a good start. But uh, you touch the back here here, and it'll it'll start to, it'll be hot to the touch, but it'll also be it'll be firm. Check the inside. It looks still a little bit pink. The the left side looks nice and good. But the right side looks like it's still not cooked yet. I didn't bring a fork of course. But I want to go down the lateral line here. Because this is the safest way to make it bone free. When you get up into the ribs. It's always, there's always a risk there of making it, of like having bone in there. But it is super hot also, so I gotta keep this well away. All these oils well away from my fingers. You see there's still a uh, pin bone uh, down the middle here, which we should be able to mostly get out. And then uh, as we kind of work around here and mash it, we're gonna keep our eyes out for any clumps of bones or single there's some single bones all right well i'm pretty happy with that i've also um you know i was prepared i really wanted this sandwich so i brought myself some mayo and i brought the maple wadobo i didn't put it on when i was cooking it because it's got a fairly high sugar content and what i was concerned with it was that that maybe it might uh it might burn in the fire i haven't tested it out yet and I really didn't want to ruin my fish sandwich today. Did I tell you guys how much I was looking forward to a fish sandwich? That's how much I was looking forward to it. I want it to be, I want it to be perfect. I want it to be the most perfectest fish sandwich in the world. What we're gonna do is take our fish and we're gonna, in skin and all, so this is gonna be like, you know, a one of a kind kind of deal here. 
lettuce, and then I, and then I brought tomato, but I got I only had cherry tomatoes, so you know those are going to be a disaster on the sandwich for sure, because they're just going to go everywhere. Well, maybe maybe we can cut the cut the tomatoes in half, then maybe they won't roll out so bad. Now if we can hold this together enough to eat it, we'll be set. Well, I'm not sure. This is a limited edition maple wadobo. Uh, we did about 500, but then Zach said if it sells well enough, we'll just keep. He'll just keep making it. So you can guys pick that up on the website. It's uh, it's basically the same formulation of the regular wadobo, but it's got uh, maple sugar in it. Not my maple sugar, unfortunately. We had some issues with you know food and drug administration. They've got to like vet everything that goes into every food, and so you know. That we had to use somebody else's maple sugar, but anyway, it's mostly maple sugar. Uh, sugar, sugar goes really well on meats. Um, you know, you do barbecue sauces. You've got your marinades. Um, you know, you think about wings and ribs. That's all. It's all cooked in sugar. So sugar, fruits, all that kind of stuff goes really, really good with meats. So this goes really good with uh, fish. Go, it'll go good with anything, any kind of meat, essentially. I'm looking at my sandwich now and I'm thinking, eh, it's a big sandwich. All right, here goes. Oh, it's a mouthful. Oh, man. That's good. I taste everything. It's got a good ratio of everything, although it's a little bit fish heavy, which is okay because it's supposed to be a fish sandwich. So I'd say that was a pretty successful day. We saved some fish from the other predator, but it came to this predator. So I would say that's a win. You know, when you're going up against other predators, you have a lot more time and energy and focus to steal your things, then you can only be in a losing proposition because those things can be ruthless. Check out Postfly, check out Mystery Tackle Box. If you guys are interested, grab some adobe spice, do that, because the only way to keep this channel going right there, now at this point is with the sponsorships because uh, YouTube revenue is poo-poo. <coughs> Mmm, that's good. That's a hearty fish sandwich. I know this next bite's gonna go all over my beard. Uh, my belly is gonna be full. A whole fish on the sandwich. A whole fish. Mm. No, the temperature is still 62. 62. 62 or 60. No, 62. 62 Fahrenheit. So that's pretty good.